Welcome, everybody. This is a really exciting conversation to be part of because um, over the years, I work, as Liz mentioned, for an audio festival. It's documentary audio called the Third Coast International Audio Festival. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that and use the opportunity to plug it. Um, but we love coming to True False and in immersing in the, the visual world of film for a few days. And when I've explained this festival to other audio producers, and I always have to say, even though it's a film festival, you really should consider going. There's so much to think about. Of course, there's a lot of audio in every film. Sound design is a key part of that. But most of all, I usually say it's got this great spirit. It's completely independent. And I often say the word, D, the, the letters, I guess, DIY, to describe the, the heart of True False. So it's really fitting, I think, on this 10th anniversary to have a conversation about the value of that and perhaps the liabilities of that a little bit. And just uh, talk to some people that are immersed themselves in that whole culture of do-it-yourself and, and find out a little bit more about what motivates them, maybe what some of the challenges they've faced in making their things go with this uh, value system in place. And, um, and then perhaps we'll have some time to hear from you. I just want a quick poll. I'd love to find out who's in a room whenever I, I'm a part of a conversation. So how many are here because they sort of picture themselves or are involved in DIY projects or um, efforts or just live their life in a way that they feel that way? And how many of you are like, aren't so sure what this DIY thing is all about? Nobody. Okay, it's not so <laughs> complicated. It's not rocket science. But um, here we will get into... How many filmmakers? Oh, that's a great question. Are how many, interested in film? Yeah, how, how many people Better? are here as filmmakers? Interesting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce everybody briefly, and then actually we'll go down the line and ask them to talk a little bit about their projects and give you just the sort of broad strokes um, elements of it, and then we'll get going with some conversation. So first we have Mikhail Mar Marchek, sorry. Yeah, you can. Michael, Michael Marchek, we'll um, producer of, or director. Both. Pro you know, this yeah. is the thing with audio, producer means something totally different. So whenever I come here, I get very confused about the roles. Director, producer of Secret Screening Green, which of course we can't say the title to because um, that would make it unsecret and that would be not great for the <laughs> but festival. But I can say it. Oh, you can say it. I didn't know about this clause. Okay. No, I think we shouldn't say the title. We'll refer you to the it. secret screening okay. green just to make sure we're <laughs> safe. Do, does anyone need to understand why? Because I've been that's saying it to case? everybody. Uh, Liz, nobody nobody can told we get me I can't say it. Confirmation about this. It's yours. I know it's a funny panel to be like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> um, anyway, can you talk? A, a, I, uh, sorry, I thought I was advised that this couldn't happen. So we'll get confirmation on that. In the meantime, could you talk about your project and? Um, broad strokes again, and then tell us a little bit about what the DIY element of it would be. Well, um, I'm here with a secret film. Um, and, uh, <laughs> some of you Wait, saw it. Nudge, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 docu it's a documentary. Well, of, of course, we're a documentary festival. Um, I shot it and edited it and um, produced it myself, basically. It's a about a group of people that shoot porn, and then they sell it on the internet, and with that money they raise, with the money they raise, they buy forests in Amazon. And uh, it's actually quite a big film. Um, it's playing here, then South by Southwest, Rotterdam. Um, it's going to get distributed theatrically in England and Germany, maybe here also. And um, I think, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if any of you have seen it, but it, I think it looks nice. It, it kind of looks like a, like a cinema film. And um, I shot it all myself and did it all myself because I really wanted it to be really close to the protagonists. So in this case, um, although we did sort of have funding, we chose the DIY way of doing it to be close to the people and just to have total control over it, which meant that we had to do a lot of things and it was kind of crazy, but I think at the end it really works out well to, to some, sometimes do that. Of course, it depends on the project. Yeah, so you, you took on more roles than you might have otherwise, so you'd have be doing them on Yeah, at the beginning it was extremely annoying, but then it really pays off at the end. So, that's me. Great, next down the row we have Emma Dassault, who is running the Folk to Folk project. Uh, she's going around the country interviewing um, DIY musicians and folk musicians and talking about maybe this re-emergence of folk as a very powerful um, kind of punk rock thing, actually. <laughs> if I'm... Yeah, uh, that's, that's a pretty good summary of it. Uh, basically, um, me and two of my friends from uh, college after we graduated decided that we really wanted to explore the connection between like the idea of DIY music communities and the tradition of folk music in America. So we... Um, took my 1997 Toyota Camry and we drove south and we interviewed a bunch of bands and people who uh, facilitate different communities. And um, 
we've just been filming short, like mini, mini documentaries, basically, like an interview and a performance video with all the bands, um, trying to kind of touch on the different themes, like whether it's uh, folk music or DIY community or punk music and folk music and the overlap between that or the definition of folk music. It's pretty broad, really. It's become like a huge, all-encompassing thing, um, but we try to break it up by doing these different focuses on different bands in different places and um, get a flavor for their communities and what it's like for them. Um, so we did that, and then after that we made a Kickstarter, which is like the, the DIY fundraising thing, I guess, and uh, we drove across the country, and then we drove, yeah, like straight across the country and back and interviewed more people, and now we're filtering through all the stuff that we've collected and trying to make something cohesive, but also non-linear out of it, because that just seems appropriate for the themes that we're trying to cover. Great, thanks. And we'll get back to funding, because that's often an issue with DIY projects and a hurdle, of course. Um, down to Emily Haymeyer, who runs an interactive um, mobile art space performance vehicle called Spore. Okay, yeah, Sorry. hi. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's for me. It's really awesome to be uh, at True Falls doing a project. This is um, kind of my hometown, home area. So um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, my my group uh, for True Falls, we did a project in front of um, the Methodist Church over kind of catty corner from the Missouri Theater. So if you see that, that's pretty much our contribution. It's a big fort-like looking thing that you can go in and explore. Um, so Sport does a number of things. We have the Chautauqua Art Lab, which is like a 10-day festival in St. Louis in um, artist-run spaces and vacant lots. Um, the Spore van travels around the country and does different projects in cities all over, small towns, um, Dollar General store parking lots. <laughs> and um, that's been going since, I think, 2009. Um, and then we also do different collaborations, um, bringing together as many artists and musicians and different people as possible. So the project that we did for True False, I think there were 23 people involved, and um, all of them were um, you know, bringing their talents, their skills, they're all artists, um, and it was like, you know, pretty awesome to have such a big collaboration. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all. Great, well, we'll, we'll ask you more in a second. Okay. And Thomas Sollings on the end uh, founded a DIY music venue in town called Hairhole, which, as Liz mentioned, we get to go troop over to, this is the greatest panel I've ever been part of, that we get a field trip at the end of it. So um, do you want to just introduce Hairhole? We'll talk a lot more about it when we're there, and you can kind of get a, get a sense of what the space is like, but maybe you could give us the picture. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've lived in this town for six and a half years, and I originally came for college and hated it. So I dropped out and moved home to rural Missouri Ozarks and realized that I needed something different. So I came here expressly to play music, and that's what I've been doing for six years, playing music. I've seen a lot of, the first DIY show I went to was at this place called The Sick Porch, and it changed my life, you know? Like you see, it's, it's just in, like an incredible thing when people organize amongst themselves and there's no like, <coughs> mediator in between you and the artist, or the crowd, or anything. You and your beer in your box, you know what I mean? There's no mediator, it's just like people together. So about four and a half years ago, we were offered to rent a building downtown. We immediately took the opportunity. Uh, so we've been practicing in there since day one. I think around six months later, we started having shows. Our first show was Time's New Viking. Uh, that was pretty notable, I thought. We've had bands from around the world, around the country come, and uh, one, one highlighting thing about the hair hole is when people come, they mostly say, this was the best show of our tour, because the community is so strong and excited for music that everyone watches or dances, and it's just very exciting, because you can be right there next to the artist, and you can give so much energy to them to create a better show for yourself even. But the hair hole has also represented a lot of collaboration over the time. And, um, but I can speak more later. Cool. I think you started talking about the emotional allure of the DIY aesthetic, and I feel like that's something I'd love to hear all of you talk a little bit more. I mean, what does DIY mean to you, and how important is it in what you do? Um, and if you could talk a little bit about maybe, uh, maybe 
the challenge, I mean, what are the challenges you face if you're sticking to a DIY sort of um, approach to things, and what are some of the hurdles you may face, as well as the payoff and the reward? So if anyone wants to jump in immediately, who has, and um, we'll just sort of, I think talk amongst ourselves, it's hard just to go down the line, but yeah. Um, so one thing that, um, that we talk about, the Chautauqua Art Lab being, isn't actually DIY, it's DIT, doing it together, mm -hmm. because it is a matter of the community being a part of it. Um, there's no actual funding for anything. So all of the spaces, all of the talent, like everything that's a part of it is, um, you know, brought by the people who are involved. And um, for me, like that's, it's really beautiful to be a part of something like that and to help make those things continue to happen. And I guess it's also like kind of this idea of an extended family, really, um, both like at home in St. Louis and then going out into other places, other cities. And it's really neat to see how uh, everything is kind of connected and related. And, um, and I, I think just like where people are coming from in their hearts, you know, more so than like, you know this person or I know that person, but just this sort of um, love for things that aren't always about money, mm -hmm. so. Anyone else have any? I mean, um, I think it's sometimes uh, really annoying to do things by yourself. Um, but it's also like a love-hate relationship, I think, with it. I mean, because for me, DIY is doing something by myself, which normally would be done by th three or four or five people. And um, so the plus of it was done by four or five people is that we separate um, and each, each person does their job the best. So the first thing is that in order to do it well, you really have to learn the skill set of those four people. So you have to work a lot. And um, I, I mean, I really think that the only reason to do DIY is if you really actually learn it well. It's not an excuse to just do it and um, do it badly, but you actually really have to learn it, the job of four people. So you have to really work your ass off. And that's what's happening in the film industry. Like people, cinematographers are now, are now becoming colorists and they're becoming their camera assistants and they're doing everything in one person, whereas before you'd have three or four people doing that. And that is a that has its extreme advantages because when it's a project pops up, you can just do it by yourself, you don't need people. Um, but it's annoying because uh, sometimes you lose focus. I mean, there's only so much our brain can, can handle. And uh, yeah, you, you lose track every now and then. It's like you, you're doing everything and then sometimes you're not doing anything. So um, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's really important to have also really good people around you that can sort of point you in the right direction and make sure that you're not losing focus and uh, to get that sort of community there um, and show your work and, and get it out there. So, because I mean, at the end of the day, who cares how you did it? The only thing that matters is what you did. So um, mm. it has to be good, it has to be really good. And I think, you know, you can't take too much pride in DIY because then you start indulging yourself. That, oh, I did everything you know, by myself and so on and so on. Whereas nobody cares, people just care about what you've done, what you've sang, what you did, what you showed. So you just got to keep that in mind, I think. Do you all agree with that? I don't agree. <laughs> well, it, it, you're talking about, it's funny, because it's a great to have people with differing <laughs> opinions, because you're talking about process and the collaboration of the yeah. process being just as important. And for you making a film, like your film is your thing that you're making at the end of the day, that's what you have to offer. So it's, yeah. it's totally understandable wh how you would see it from different <laughs> points of view. Um, but you were also saying you don't even see it as an independent sort of one person kind of thing, because sure, it's sure. more. Yeah. So, so we're even like talking about d different degrees of the DIY concept. Um, yeah. Sarama? Oh, um, well, I mean, for like for folk to folk, um, I mean, the inspiration for the project was we, uh, like me and the two other people who were working on it, uh, we went to school in Boston, and I mean, not that it, Boston's a great city, but uh, as an undergraduate, when you're under 21, there's sort of like not that much that you can do there. It's like you can go to a 18 and up show and you'll feel sort of separated from everything. Or you can wait till you're 21 and then you can go to bar shows. Or for a while, at least, there was this really great <coughs> DIY community, music community, and people would come together and play shows and it would be hosted by people that you knew or went to school with or worked with or whatever. And the people who played would be also like in that same group and there was something really inspiring about that. So that is sort of what inspired us to, to do the project. So the project is inspired by DIY. And then at the same time, the project itself is also really DIY because like you were saying, like 
obviously you want the product that you make to be good. Um, and uh, we all went to school for journalism and when we graduated had this sort of idea of this thing that we wanted to produce but didn't quite know how. So we all sort of like really worked together to develop these skill sets that have created what it is now. So I don't know, I mean, I think that there's truth to both things. Like I don't think that this project would exist if we couldn't do it together at the same time. Like, and it wouldn't exist because we also wouldn't have been inspired by people doing things together. But at the same time, like, if it, but if we were in it, not able to acquire the skills to make it what it is now or what it's becoming or what we're working for it to become, then, I don't know, we probably wouldn't be here either. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Thomas, anything? Um, I definitely prescribe more to the DIT, I guess, would be do, do it together if we were going to try and, like, subdivide <laughs> these genres <laughs> of work ethic. Deconstruct um, this from the Right. However, DIY, I think, encompasses both, you know, collaboration and working hard for yourself and what you want to see happen, because I, I think that's a lot of the times the first step is, like, you see what you want to be done, yeah. but you don't see it being done. Or you see it being done, but you have no access to it because of various reasons. So DIY is just, like, sidestepping all the rules and regulations and making your life what you want it to be. And that can be by yourself or with your in, an entire town of people, you yeah. know. It's sort of like DIY tea, really. Doing yeah. like we're all in this <laughs> together, but we all have. But I think the you also comes from the sense that um, all of these projects are in response to mainstream or prescribed ways of doing things. So there is an us against you a little bit. I, I feel like a lot of that uh, culture comes from a, um, doing something in spite of the way most people expect it to be done, or certainly with very little funding. I mean, it's just hard to do that. So yeah. um, I think there, there's a little bit of tension positive tension, if that's possible, built into the whole sort of, from the get-go, the whole idea of DIY. Um, I wonder if any of you have made decisions, come to a crossroads where maybe you had some opportunities to, I don't know, jump the, the DIY train, funding from a sponsor that you didn't necessarily agree with, or um, the opportunity to, to do something for someone that might not have been something you would have sought out, and had to sort of wrestle with a decision that... Um, you went with the, the DIY way, or didn't, no judgment calls here, people have to figure out ways to get their projects out there, and I think that's, um, you know, as projects grow, that's one of the harder decisions that you come upon, is how do you maintain this essence of what you're working on when you really want to finish it, you want to get it out, but, you know, if you're struggling for financial reasons or other logistical reasons. I think that it, it's a lot more broad than, like, I, I made a decision to get funded by this company, you know, I think that's DIY because what you've done has created an opportunity for you to accept that funding, you know, mm -hmm. if that was to happen to you, you know. Um, I think that the essence is just to, well, I don't know what the essence is. I won't even make that statement. It's silly. <laughs> that's but, uh, <laughs> different and shared, I would say. Right. Uh, everyone. I think just like, remembering that for me remembering that I can share all of this with my friends and um, I don't know I don't know where to go with that yeah. <laughs> anyone else had, had a mo had, had no had, had a moment I mean this is kind of personal stuff actually to talk about in front of people because we're also invested in what we do and we love it and it is the things we've cultivated ourselves so um, maybe it would be even hard to talk about, but if there's something that... I don't know, I think it's just really about my... I mean, we're all different, so this is weird, because we're all talking about completely different worlds. Um, in the film world, like, even if you do your film, and then you have a sales agent that comes on board, or somebody takes up your film and does the promotion, distribution, there's not much you can actually do, because they're gonna do their thing anyway. I mean, that, that's how it works. Of course, you can go with a nice company and you can try to fish a company out that is sort of also a little bit DIY or, or sort of a little bit in that when we started like that and has that sort of spirit of working with you, working creatively with you. Um, but if you don't, if you're not fortunate enough to, to have a really good company that is going to back you up and work with you side by side and try to make the best of what you've done, then 
if you have the skills, if you know something about distribution, if you've done it before, yeah. if you've like tried to get your film out there by yourself, and you've met all the festival programmers and you've met the people, then you can really sort of try to control it in a way, and then the people will treat you as a partner. And um, so I, again, it's I think we're, we're screwed because we have to acquire so many skill sets in order not to be screwed by all the other people that try to screw us. You can just screw yourself up. Yeah, so it's, I, I think that's the, that's, that's the sad part, I that like, why. you can never like, like, just let your project go and you know, like leave it in someone's hands. Because the people right. promise you everything, yeah. but in the end it never turns out that way. You have to just control it all the way throughout the end. So um, yeah, it's best to do something small before and then use that experience on something bigger. But uh, yeah, film was difficult in that regard. Distribution is a pain. Yeah, and I guess, I guess in the world that I'm operating in is probably similar to like a nonprofit. And so that's always been a question is if this should become a nonprofit and what that would mean and how funding would happen and that kind of thing. And that move hasn't happened yet simply because you know, it's a lot of paperwork, it's more, there's a board. Yeah. Um, as the main organizer, I wouldn't have, I would, I would have to refer to a board versus making decisions um, on my own or with the help of collaborators. So it creates kind of more of a, a bureaucracy, I guess. Um, but that's a question that I think comes up every year, is like, is this a possibility? Or then if we are gonna do things with funding, um, could we get a partner? What would a partnership be like? And I don't think those things are necessarily bad by any means, but I think that um, it's just what makes sense, you know, and what makes sense when. So, and that is something that may change with Spore in the future. There's a real fine line between wanting what you do to, to sustain and grow and perhaps grow, and at some point, you know, what do you have to do to make that happen? If it's for Spore becoming a nonprofit, so then you can. Um, reach more people even because somehow sure. you have, you know, so there, I think there's a tension there too with uh, what, what what's the goal and what's the future and, you know, at what level can you sustain what you're doing um, without making significant changes that might challenge what you feel about a DIY sort of approach. Um, what's the, what do you, what are you planning for folk to folk? Um, well, I mean, that's like one of the funny things about it is when we, when we first started out, we were thinking um, we're just going to make a, a web series, basically, like short documentary minis that people can either watch the interview part, part of or watch the performance part and take what they will away from it. Um, and then we decided that we wanted to make a short documentary. Um, and then we quickly decided that part of the beauty or like part of the great part about it was the idea that people could sort of navigate it themselves. So now we're trying to make it into more of an interactive documentary and we're trying to really base it on a map of the United States because you know, we're focusing on America specifically, or American folk and American DIY culture specifically. Um, so that's actually one of, like, I mean, we, we haven't had any opportunities to have big funding or anything, but like, as we go on and uh, the skill set that we need to acquire grows and grows and grows, we sort of hit these walls of like, okay, I have this idea of what it would look like if we could do this, but can we even do this? Like, should we, what, what path should we navigate next to make this into a reality? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, um, and we're, we're all in places where we're trying to navigate the world outside of our own, like, little project. So the, the balance is hard to find. Um, but I do think that, yeah, I think there are ways, like uh, what, what you said, I, I think it's, um, if you get to a point where somebody wants to fund you and help you, then you did do that yourself. I mean, you've made something that someone is confident enough in that they want to help you out, hopefully, unless they're, mm -hmm. you know, evil corporate monsters who want to de destroy everything. But. <laughs> but then there's the side of the equation where ev evil corporate monsters should actually be funding, you know, like, they should be funding arts if they've got a ton right. of money, if they're going to fund stuff, you know. So of I course. think, like, that, that sort of, that can be the devil on both shoulders, sort of, when you get to that point. Yes. Um, I mean, I yeah. say that with a grain of salt. Yes, and I, and I don't mean to even ask the question as if it's bad if any of that happens, because um, just from my own personal experiences with our festival, we've had to, We've had to navigate going from being a part with a partner to being independent and making all these decisions. Um, and we we found such a, a, um, such a reward in the creative control we had once we were independent that we felt like that was such a big asset to what we were doing. And of course, the funding piece is a total headache and nightmare. But but at the heart of it, we love what we do. The project is what we have. And I, I feel like that's probably a similar thing for all of us. We're doing what we love. We're working. DIY, I think, often and comes along with a lot of extra hours, you know, late nights, early mornings, 
no weekends, kind of um, just 24-7 immersed in what you do, and you do it because you love it, and probably a lot of people in this room can relate to that. And, um, and then when you get into a room with a lot of people that do that, you realize, yes, this is the way we, we want to do this. We want to live. We want to be. We want to make things. So um, I'm gonna, we have about 10 more minutes before the field trip section of the panel. Does, are there any comments or questions? There's a roving mic, and since this is being recorded, we'd love for you to wait until it gets to you before you say something. I thought this crowd of all crowds would have a, a lot to contribute. Here's a question or comment or hand. There it goes. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's not on, but... Yep. Um, I wondered if anybody wanted to speak to... Okay. Thanks, sorry. <laughs> I wondered if anybody wanted to comment about um, <clears throat> when you involve personal politics and DIY projects and how that can be a uniting or very dividing force in communities or among collaborators. I think that uh, it's pretty easy to see DIY as a political decision or not a political decision. I think it can take any form. Um, I've, seen, I've seen politics divide communities to a point where there's two separate communities that used to be one, you know. And, but I've also seen it, you know, unite people to take action against things they don't really want to be involved with or like to try and change uh, things in the world that they see that is unjust. And I think to do that in a DIY sense is to actually come closer to your core values and see the change that you want to see because you aren't going through um, an organization that has an opinion. You know, it's your opinion and you try and make the change you want. So I think political affiliation in DIY is kind of like, a, it has a more like pure opinion or like perspective because it's your own and not like a party line or, you know, it could be, but I think that you just don't have to involve yourself with those traditional ways as much. Even beyond politics, I think there's often a lot of people, a lot of DIY organizations tend to be smaller, but everyone invested it feels as strongly about things, and that's where some of the complications can, can happen, and opinions can start to diverge, whether it's over political issues or aesthetic issues, and um, y yeah, I mean, it, it gets very personal and emotional very quickly, too, so that, that is a challenge. I mean, I would say all projects face those, but maybe DIY projects face them in, sp in particular ways. Um, with, uh, with the Chautauqua Art Lab, which is one of the events we do in St. Louis, um, the reason that started was to connect different communities that were divided, so or just didn't know about each other. Um, and St. Louis is, I, I think, unique in a lot of ways in terms of, um, you know, there's been negative population growth for 40 years, uh, which is slowly changing, which is really good. But there's a lot of different things happening, and for a while, um, people really didn't know about each other. So one thing that the Art Lab does is tries to kind of um, get some collaborations going um, with people who, uh, you know, may enjoy working together. And I think in the end, it's created a stronger community overall, um, or at least people have gotten to talk, which is cool. Um, yeah, and I really, I don't know, I, those situations, I think, happen all the time, too, whether or not you want them to. But um, I personally, um, I don't know, really try to create bridges wherever possible, but yeah. Nicole, I'm curious, would you make your next film the same way? Do you feel like this is your mode of making films now because you uh, reaped enough benefit from doing so much yourself, or was it just so hard you'd prefer maybe? It, it really depends on the subject matter, I think. I mean, especially in documentary. Um, I think that it's really beneficial sometimes to if you do it yourself, you can get a much better emotional connection with your protagonists. Yeah. And you just live through the story. It, it becomes an adventure. It doesn't become, instead of making a film, you're living an adventure with these people, and then the film is sort of secondary, and that's where you can capture really beautiful moments and live together through uh, 
those moments and then capture them on film, and uh, and hopefully the audience will feel sort of will resonate with that. Um, so I really think it matters the subject matter. It is sometimes annoying. I mean, when I look at my friends that sort of went the classical way, where they work with cinematographers, editors, producers, they can do three films in two years, mm. or, or two films, and I've only done one because I have to do everything myself. So it is annoying, and it gets frustrating at yes, times. Yeah. But so um, it really depends. But I think I mean I hope. That's why I do it. I hope that sort of the skills that I've learned will, will like let me work on other films with other people on a completely different level, on a much more efficient level. Yeah. So we see where it takes us. I mean, I recommend it really to everybody as a starting point yeah. um, in today's world because um, on the other hand, I have so many friends that never did that. And then you know, if, if, if you have any troubles getting big funding, you're, you're done. You can't make a movie because you don't know how to do it all yourself. So it's good to have that because you're free. Yeah. And then in a documentary, especially sometimes, like you want to go away and just try for a couple of days by yourself, and or for for many, many more. It's good to be able to do that, just do it yourself. So, it's uh, yeah, it's I think in today's world, it's comfortable to to have that. In today's world too, you can do things yourself and also reach out to communities of other people doing that. I mean, where you can be so connected, I think, in more easily than maybe in the past. Um, but then again, you become dependent, like if you start thinking that way with the team thing, of course, but then you know you have to find those people and then you, yeah. it, it becomes the same thing. You have to find other DOI people. And I guess, um, sorry to keep drawing from my experience, but I guess it feels natural. So uh, I'm part of a radio community and there's an independent producer list. So all these producers like work totally by themselves and talk about wearing, one. they wear all the hats. Radio producers often mix, record, write, narrate. You know, There's a, a much smaller work crew involved with each documentary. Um, but there's this online community, so when there are any tech questions that come up at all, like r microphone brand, you know, how far to stand with a boom mic, anything small and technical, there's this list that provides answers within like minutes of a question getting asked. So I guess that's what I was kind of thinking. Yeah, no, that of course, yeah, it's advisors for sure. You need yeah. to have a lot. And, and so I mean, you, you also have to give, I think. It's really important to help and support. Yeah, I think people that work independently are very, by selfish. and large, generous, yeah, with what they know and really see themselves all as working toward a a similar cause and want to help. So um, I think we have about five. F let's ask one more question and then we oh, here, do you have a question? Is the mic around? And then we'll have to start getting bustled. And then as, as the mic's coming up, so the hair hole is actually about to close. Is that correct? Correct. Great. So there's at, there must be a good story there, which will leave everyone cliffhanging. So you mm -hmm. can tell the story once we get there. We can. Okay. Um, great. Question. Um, well, there seems to be some disparities amongst the panel of how you define DIY personally. Yes. And I was just <laughs> curious that um, DIY has kind of become synonymous with a like punk rock culture or aesthetic. And do you see it as a culture or do you see it as a personal work ethic as uh, Michael had seemed to talk about? So, or do you think that those two merge in some way? Thanks, great question. I think that I think that it can be both. I mean, I think that they merge in some way. I think that there's the aspect of it where it is a culture, like it's a punk or just I don't know. Um, Punk's dead. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> we'll be debating this on the way over to the hall. Actually, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a it's a culture and maybe like a little bit of an attitude that's maybe synonymous with what what punk was. <laughs> <laughs> or is um, at the same time, I think that it can be a work ethic. I mean, I think it's like it's a term. It's it's a term like many other terms that are words that are thrown around a lot in American culture, where it can mean anything to any number of people. And I mean, it's that that's really great in a way, but in another way, it can be kind of confusing because it's like, what does that mean? But I mean, I think that like even on this panel, like we're all talking about very different aspects of the same word, pretty much. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I think it can be both. I think that they merge, for sure. Do you all can talk about yourselves as DIY projects? Is that like in part of, is that semantics? Is that in your vocabulary? We say independent. I don't know. Like, yeah. yeah. I don't know if, definitely uh, when, we, when we made our Kickstarter video, we had DIY in it somewhere. But um, I think when I'm defining it to other people, it's, it's an independent project. We're not doing it for someone else. We're doing it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, we definitely use DIY quite a bit, uh, but I would say that um, DIY transcends 
history through many, many years, and we can't really relate it to some sort of modern culture or anything, because it's not. I think that DIY is a way of viewing um, the world, and there's DIY punk and there's not DIY punk. There's DIY filmmaking, there's not DIY film mm. filmmaking, you know. Um, but I think certain cultures have an easier time of interacting with it, you know. But no, I don't, I don't really think that um, you could call it a modern idea or anything. Hmm. Or okay, you, or even so something I'm, I'm that's like, yeah, please. I was going to say, or even something that's like strictly American, or, you know, <laughs> I was just in India <laughs> for human. a month, and like that's like one of the most DIY places I've ever been, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or human, mm -hmm. or, yeah. What are the most DIY animals? <laughs> Ants. Ants. <laughs> Wolverines. Um, did you have a last <laughs> I mean, I just. <laughs> I mean, to end it on a happy note, I, you know, <laughs> DIY is the mother of all invention. I mean, I think anything, like anything and everything that sort of moved our culture along has been yeah. DIY. Like, I mean, dogma and uh, like everything. It's like, this is where all the great things happen. So I think you just have to really look, um, not just to do it yourself, but to be, like, try to, you know, use it to be, to do something new with it. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah. Well, it's clear we've, we're all always reinventing what it means and re exploring what it means in all these different ways. Cool. What a great discussion. Um, it's not over. We're going to walk over to the hair hole now, and I encourage you to reach out to someone you don't know who's in this panel on the walk over and get to know more about their DIY thoughts on the way over. And there'll be a pop quiz when we get there. So.